Good morning and welcome back to the recording studios for the Woodstock Church of Christ. It's good to have another opportunity to study God's word and, and to worship him. I hope everyone is healthy and happy and growing as the church, perhaps in ways that you didn't think you would grow quite as much. Uh, it's amazing how many times I've heard people say, you know, I've really gotten to know so-and-so a lot better because we have had more time to communicate by phone or by email, by texting, whatever. And um, I, I've really gotten to know this person more so than I was able to do when we were together. And that's just another one of the many blessings that God is bringing to us. And I believe in his good providence that he is kind of readjusting all of our schedules in order to readjust perhaps some priorities and it teaches some lessons that maybe we're not in as much control of things as sometimes we think when when times are in our minds a little bit better or a little bit smoother. Uh, God is going to bless and he's going to grow us and we need to let him do that uh, for our good and his glory. We want to uh, make sure that we send the surveys back into the elders so they can uh, go over those to better uh, enable them to make decisions relative to the time when we can get back together again. And after we do get back together, uh, how that phasing process will take place and what we will be doing and not doing when we do get together. So please get those surveys turned back in. We want to remember the Johnson family, uh, Michael and Misty and Lux. Michael's grandfather passed away this past week. Our thoughts are with them and certainly our love and we appreciate them so very much and we wish them safe travel uh, to and from. And we want to keep in mind Diane Whitener as well. She is uh, experiencing some AFib issues and we hope those get taken care of very soon. Want to also keep in mind the, uh, the great news from last week, Mary Hestad uh, being baptized into Christ and we uh, certainly congratulate her and uh, her parents, uh, Bruce and Stephanie, and uh, we, we look forward to her growth and fellowship in the kingdom. Following that baptism, after uh, I got back down into the men's locker room or the men's dressing room, Eric was assisting me down there and he said, Matt, he said, I need to give you these. He said, you need to take care of the light switch at the, uh, at the back of your head. And I put my hand at the back of my head. I said, I didn't know I had a light switch at the back of my head. He said, no, no, no. He says, when you're recording the light plate uh, on the light switch that's behind your right shoulder. He said, I've been noticing that the bottom screw has been missing. This bottom screw at the bottom of the plate. Well, I tell you, we have some fastidious elders. We really do. And that's a good quality to have you know, as a shepherd, really think about it. Well, I, uh, I took the screws and I, I put one in and not only did I put the screw in here on the, in the light switch plate, but I also made sure that I adjusted, you know, the little slit on the head of the, of both screws. I want you to notice if, if you can see, uh, that they are both in the horizontal direction. And I'm sure that that is going to make our lesson go a lot smoother and, and no one is going to think of this light switch. I better move the camera, better uh, readjust our, uh, our recording here. No one is going to be looking at this light switch now that it's uh, right where it needs to be. And I, I appreciate Eric. I, I don't know if, 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 if Eric was coming to him, uh, coming to me personally. Uh, or if he was speaking for the whole eldership, but I'm telling you what, uh, no one has it on them. We, we First class, this recording studio is nothing but class, and uh, I appreciate that very much. I want to talk to you this morning about segregation of the congregation, pandemic 2020. I have heard so many phrases since we have been uh, quarantined that go something like this. You know, I am just ready for this to be over. I'm ready for normal to be back. 
I'm done with quarantine. So many phrases like that, and we've all heard them. Um, a couple of phrases, though, that I've heard has been, at least to some degree, the motivation for this lesson. I've heard some say this, you know, I can really get used to worshiping like this. One person said, you know, this is really me. This this is ve this is very comfortable. I, I I can get into this. I could get used to this worship, not having to dress up and not having to get out of bed and, and and to go to a formal service. Well, you know, when when I heard this, this was almost like uh what I remember David not wanting to be when he was at the threshing floor of Arana. Do you remember back in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 around verse 24? He said that he would not offer worship to God that didn't cost him something. He realized that he was to bring the sacrifice, not only of praise, but the sacrifice of himself, and he was to give honor and glory to God in worship. David said that he was glad when it was said, let's go to the house of the Lord. And I hope that we all have that same sentiment. It is my hope and prayer. Listen, it is my hope and prayer that we have grown accustomed to worshiping at home, but not in place of assembling. That would be sinful. I hope that we have had enough home worship now that we are going to have daily devotionals with our families. I hope that we've grown so accustomed to worshiping that it becomes second nature to worship at home, but not in lieu of, in addition to the regular public assemblies. To do otherwise would be sinful. And, and let me say from the get-go, we're not talking about the elderly the shut-in, the sick, the caregivers. We understand they're not forsaking any assembly. All forsaking is not missing. And we're going to be talking about that today. And my lesson this morning is, a, is an ardent plea. In fact, some rumblings of this kind happened even before the pandemic came. Forsaking the assembling for worship is something that one chooses to do. And we hope that no one will choose to do that. Well, Hebrews 10.25 still says, and you know, every time that I read this passage or quote it or hear it, uh, hear it read, few are the times that I do that that I don't think of people who have encouraged me not to talk so much about the negative aspect of that. Uh, not so much the negative aspect of that verse, but my mind quickly goes to the idea, you know, the Holy Spirit did that. I didn't write that. And he's the one that says, not forsaking ourselves together. Don't do that. You know, and when we look at worship in the New Testament, we, we see so many times where the, the brethren were encouraged to come together. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples did what? Not stream their service individually in their homes. But when they came together, together to break bread, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, again, another classic text in the New Testament relative to the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul writes this, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Remember, they were abusing the Lord's Supper. But the point I want to make here is, is that they were admonished and they understood they were to come together to worship God. 
that same assembling that would later be said that Christians are not to forsake. And then again, down in verse 18, for first of all, when you come together as the church. And again in verse 20, therefore, when you come together, not in multiple places, not in many places, when you come together in one place. You know, when the Woodstock Church first began streaming uh, the services, this was a major consideration. Would there be any of us that would get accustomed to watching the streaming or the recording of a lesson or the service, and that would become the rule rather than the exception? Or that would be done by people who could be at the service but choose not to be. And I hope and pray that that will never be the case with one person. Will anyone substitute home worship for assembling together when this is all said and done? This would be wrong. This would be sinful. This would be in direct violation of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Well, I want us to notice three points this morning as we consider segregation for the congregation pandemic 2020. I want us to look at, first of all, from the biblical context, the law of concern. In the second place, I want us to look at the law of consistency. And then lastly, I want us to consider the biblical law of capitulation, of submission. First of all, the law of concern. The Bible teaches that. The golden text of the Bible, probably next to John 3, 16, Matthew 7, 12 is the verse commonly known. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. You know, it was, it was interesting when uh, we first began to start wearing masks in public. I was like, I would assume most men, because when I go into the stores now with my mask on, I see about 85% of the men not wearing masks. But I only see maybe 25% of the women not wearing masks. You know, for when I started to wear a mask, it was at the kind, loving insistence of my wife. And she was giving me all of the uh, medical reasons with all of the uh, hygienic arguments why I needed to wear the mask. And I said, no, listen, Chris, I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to be careful to stay away and I'm not going to touch anything. And, uh, you know, I will do my very best, you know, to keep myself. She says, wait, she says, this is not about you. When you wear the mask, it's not mainly to protect you, it's to protect the other person. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. So, touche uh, to Chris, I now wear my mask when I go out into public without any, without any complaint. You know, and it's amazing what uh, government statistics show concerning catching this virus and if we would just listen and quarantine better, and, and many of us have done that, and wear our mask when we go into public, and, and wash our hands more, I, I know it, it, it sounds kind of immature to have to be told that, but uh, they're stirring up our pure minds, as Peter would say, by way of remembrance. It's always good to have a refresher course in that, and to do what we need to do. Well, in Matthew chapter 12, uh, beginning at verse number one, there is a very, very interesting text here relative to uh, the Pharisees. Imagine that. And they were always, you know, trying to uh, trap Jesus and get him killed and get him out of the way. So, you know, they could, uh, their glory could, as they saw it, be... Uh, uh, it could go go on, and 
And, and, and Matthew records in verse 1 of chapter 12, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Uh-oh. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, have you not read? How many times have, have, have Jesus said that? Have you not read? Have you not considered? Do you not know? Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless because they are doing work in there? Yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. That's the Lord himself. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, right? Down in verse eight. But if you had, had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. You know, back in Matthew chapter nine as well, listen to what Jesus is saying here, uh, beginning at verse nine. As he passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So Matthew arose and followed him. And it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, how many times during the ministry of Jesus do we see that phrase? And when the Pharisees saw it. You, knew, you know what's coming next. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Those who are well, Jesus said when he had heard that, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. Here it is again. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Over in Luke uh, chapter 14, we won't go and read it all, but there was a situation that a woman was suffering. And for 18 years, and the Pharisees would not show mercy. And the same idea is expressed that the Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice. What is the principle in this for us? It's not that we are not to do the will of God, but there are some situations, life-threatening situations, where God demands of us mercy. It's the idea of the ox or the donkey falling on the ditch in the on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, you know, there are times... Pharisees, where there's not a one, a one of you that won't take your animal and feed that animal or allow that animal to drink on the Sabbath. But here is one that's suffering for 18 years and you will show no mercy. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy above sacrifice. And you know, that's the same idea back in the Old Testament. Do you remember how many times the Lord said, listen, your worship is not acceptable because your attitude, your heart is not right. In Hosea chapter six and verse six, Hosea writes, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. I want you to understand God is saying what my priority is. If there is somebody that's dying, I desire you to show mercy to that person more than the obligations of the law. That is not a license, as the Bible would say, to use the law unjustly. How many times do we hear people using liberty and freedom unjustly? Well, I'm a free person. I'm free to do whatever I want. It's not what the Lord is teaching here. 
Some have contracted the COVID-19 virus. And many have died. I have come into this last week the knowledge of one preacher friend of mine and his wife who have contracted the virus. And they're having a very rough time of it. And you know, one of the laws of the Bible is the law of concern, of mercy. Now, surely there wouldn't be anyone, any Pharisee among us today that would say that my friend and his wife have forsaken the uh, assembling. I don't think anyone would say, you know, when the shooting happened down at the congregation in Texas and they canceled their services the rest of the day that they shouldn't have done that. No, I, I think everybody in their more sober moments, no matter what is even being discussed on Facebook now, that uh, the elders have no right to cancel services during this time. And I beg to differ, and I will differ in just a little bit. But are these passages and, and like passages just ignored when it comes to when it comes to this virus? Do you remember what we have been studying in Philippians on Wednesday night? Do you remember uh, verses three and four of Philippians chapter two? I think you do remember. Listen, let nothing be done through selfish am uh, ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That's one principle upon which we wear a mask. That's one principle upon which that we want to exercise the law of concern, our first point, and we want to understand that God wants mercy before sacrifice. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Well, you know, in the Old Testament, there was an example of quarantining. Do you remember in Leviticus 13, beginning at verse 1? When someone had leprosy, he would present himself to the priest, to the, to the high priest, and he would look at that sore, and he would notice, he would notice the color, he would notice if there were hairs growing out of it, and he would notice different things, and, and he would put the person in quarantine for seven days. And then he would come back and present himself to the priest again. And if there wasn't any growth, if it, if it didn't go over his body, if, if it didn't discolor, then he would put him in uh, isolation seven more days. And then if it was still good, he would be released. He would come out of quarantine. You see, they were looking out for each other's interests. They didn't want anybody to catch leprosy. And when that plague, that disease was over, he would come out of quarantine. Folks, what's the difference? What biblical principle takes us away from that? You know, just because no one has died at Woodstock, we have people dying around us. In fact, this preacher friend of mine and his wife are in what would be considered a secluded area. They're not in a hot spot. Never thought this would happen to them. Did the person quarantined because of leprosy forsake any religious assembly? No, they didn't forsake it because they didn't have a choice. Forsaking an assembling happens when I choose not to be there. Not because I can't be there. Or there's not a life and death situation that would prohibit me from being there. I remember uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, I was on my way to Bible study on Wednesday night and I, I called the church building and I forget who it was that I first spoke with, but I indicated to that person that there was a damsel in distress and I had to help her get her donkey out of the ditch. And the person understood what I meant. The Lord desires mercy and then sacrifice. And I think it would do us well to understand that even in uh, our situation.
uh, with this virus. But secondly, not only is there the law of concern, but there's the law of consistency. And we've been referring to that when we, when we read in Hebrews 10.25, not to forsake, not the assembly. It's not like one assembly. It's, it's any worship where the church assembles. Don't forsake the assembling when one chooses not to attend. Sometimes we are prevented from attending. That's missing. That's not forsaking. And we understand that. The sick, the caregiver, the, the elderly that cannot get out, we're not referencing that. But for example, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, and in other places in Acts, you know when the church was being persecuted, they were scattered abroad. Guess what, friends? They weren't able to worship together. I wonder what they did. I bet they did exactly what we're doing, worshiping in small groups, worshiping in caves, perhaps, worshiping in secret. Now, what they could have done, that would have been an option, they could have stood up against the government and said, we will just, you know, uh, worship when we please, where we please, and we're not going to consider anything that you say at all. Well, that would just basically get them killed, I guess. So they took the first and best available option to them apart from assembling together. Now, we're not told about the detail of their worship when they scattered abroad, but if they're scattered abroad, we know that they all weren't together. I think we can logically assume that. When John was on the Isle of Patmos, we're studying the book of Revelation uh, before we were, we were put apart in our Sunday morning Bible class. Do you remember what it was said about John when he was uh, in exile there in Revelation chapter one? He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Nobody else there. He worshiped alone because he couldn't be with his group, with his family, with, with, with the church worshiping together. Somebody asked me during this thing, is it scriptural to worship alone? John did it. Now, all of the aspects of worshiping together will not be there when we worship alone. And I'm thinking the horizontal part of our worship. You know, worship consists really of two different directions. There's the vertical worship as we worship God, but there's also horizontal worship when we sing to one another. We, we pray uh, for and with each other. Communion, there is horizontal communion, but there's also vertical communion. There is glory and worship that we give to God, but there are lessons and things that we teach each other on a horizontal level. Now, if I'm worshiping alone, there's no horizontal worship, but there certainly is the vertical worship. Even when it pertains to partaking of the Lord's Supper. And so I encouraged this person, yes, worship alone. You have biblical precedent for doing that. Oh, but someone might say in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, doesn't the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Beloved, can I ask you something? Never quote that passage of scripture when you're talking about worship. That is totally lifting that out of its context. Yes, it's true that two or three can worship together, but it's also true that one can worship. In that context, in Matthew chapter 18, that was a church fellowship issue. And God is simply saying that if two or three agree on this point, that someone needs to be disfellowshipped, there the Lord is approving of that. There I'm with them. That has nothing to do with if somebody decides that they would like to forsake the assembling either by going fishing or by going on vacation. Yes. That, uh, you know, that they can forsake those times and, and just work. Because anyway, anywhere, anywhere I am, if two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That has nothing to do with worship. And it certainly violates Hebrews 10, 25, when I can be with my brethren in worship, assembling together. But you, but you have to understand that if we're going to apply this uh, this law of consistency, then we need to be consistent across the board. You see, 
we are not being able right now to come together. Not because we choose not to be together. We're trying to not spread a virus. And don't we tell people this on an individual level? Hey, if you've got a fever, don't come and, and infect everyone else. Well, we know very little about this virus. We don't know. In fact, it's very likely that some of us have it. We don't know we have it. And so we are not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as some are falsely saying that we do on some of these internet discussions. And the other idea here is not correct either, since we are in this situation, let's get accustomed to this. You know, uh, uh, you know, I can get used to this break from formal worship. No, 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 no. How much do you miss assembling? A, a, an honest answer to that question will go a long way in deciding if our attitude toward God is right. How many of us are thinking this is a break and how many of us cannot wait to get back? The faithful child of God will never say, hey, I'm going to substitute home worship for corporate worship. But lastly, not only do we need to consider the law of concern and the law of consistency, but there is another important law. This is the law of capitulation. This is the law that says, I need to submit and I need to humble myself in my thinking. You know, I've heard in some of these discussions that the elders do not have the right to cancel services. Well, I don't believe that most believe that, but sometimes uh, those that that talk and type the loudest believe some of these things. It is true that the elders cannot forbid anybody or cancel worship. No, we have a mandate from God that we worship. The government and eldership, no one can do that. But that is a far cry from saying that the eldership cannot cancel services. And we know that. What, what if they, uh, we, we live in an area at the, and in this time of year where uh, tornadoes come through? Well, what, what if a tornado is, is, uh, is located in our area and it would not be best for us to come together? Uh, would it be the right of the eldership to make a decision, hey, we don't need to come together tonight? There's, there's a tornado that's, whatever, 30 miles away. I believe the Bible gives them that right to make those kinds of decisions. You see, what happens many times, governments can say, now, you are not to worship, or you are not to teach the gospel. If a blanket statement like that is made, and I don't know of any eldership that would ever say something like that, but even if a government said that, that's the context of Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, when the apostle says that we ought to obey God rather than man, that's when they were forbidding worship. But canceling a service is not forbidding worship. Not in any sense of the imagination. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 17, the Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. And as we saw earlier, they were fastidious in doing that. And so they are in this situation as well. And we need to be grateful to God. And I, for one, applaud them in what they're doing, the degree they're going and trying to figure this thing out and to do what is best. And as good leaders always do, they get the opinions of those that they're leading and make their decision based at least in part on what the desire of the folks are to a degree that they can, and come up with their decision. They have every right to make that decision. But not, all, not only 
should we capitulate to the eldership, but we also need to submit to the government, the civil government. And, uh, and, and, you, and you know what Romans chapter 13 is expressing? God wants us to be the best citizens of any country. And the best citizens of any country should be Christians. It shouldn't be the ones always clamoring for their rights. They shouldn't be the ones that always are clamoring for their way. You know, that is not how Christians are supposed to, to act. Paul says, let every soul be subject, capitulate, to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. You know, I, I see a lot of religious groups and even churches of Christ who are standing against the government and are defying what they have requested that we do. They are not telling us not to worship. They are saying for a time in respect for the public good you need to suspend your services temporarily for a time. They're not telling us not to worship like we're doing. In fact, if I would ask most governmental officials, policemen, whoever, is this a good thing? They would applaud the fact we're doing what we're doing. Would it not be adhering to the law of capitulation in the scripture, how we are to submit to one another, submit to the eldership, submit to the government. Why do we lose reasoning power when it comes to this? Paul goes on to say, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have the praise from the same. For he is God's deacon. He is God's diakonos. He is his minister, the government, to you for good. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but for conscience sake. And what a good testimony we have to be able to submit to the government when we can. You know, this idea that always downgrades policemen, that always downgrades authority, that always uh, uh, need, needing to be sit, sitting down during the national anthem or not respecting our flag. You know, yes, people have a right to do that. But Christians ought to exercise their liberty and their freedoms to do the right thing and to have the right attitude about these things. And I believe that's one of many lessons that the Lord is allowing us to learn during this time. So when we think of segregation for our congregation, pandemic 2020, let's remember the law of concern. Let's remember the law of consistency, and let's remember the law of capitulation as we seek to glorify God in whatever state we find ourselves and how we can serve our fellow man the most. We've got a lesson to teach, and we can teach it very well as we're doing it during this time of isolation. If there is anyone that needs to respond to heaven's invitation, I would ask that if you would text me or call me or one of the elders and we can do that privately. Or if you wish, we can announce that uh, the next time we get together and we can, we can pray with you and for you. If there was, if there's anyone that needs to obey the gospel by being baptized into Christ, just like Mary did last week, uh, that building isn't uh, in such a lockdown that we won't uh, agitate the waters and baptize you into Christ. We'd love to do it. If you have any response at all, just, just let us know. Thank you for uh, listening, and I hope this has been encouraging as, as we've studied uh, the proper attitude that we need to have as, as we are part. And we look forward so much to being back together soon. Good morning. I hope everyone is enjoying a wonderful Mother's Day. 
I want to take just a minute to thank the mothers for all that you do for your families. We find such great examples of mothers in Scripture. Samuel, Samuel's mother, Hannah, uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother, uh, Eunice and Lois, uh, Moses' mother, Jochebed, uh, others like Elizabeth and Sarah and Rebecca, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and there are many others. These mothers had such great influence on their children and their families. And I know that each of the mothers today can have just as much influence as these. You know, there's very little uh, that is more important than mothers and fathers, for that matter, uh, raising children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, uh, raising uh, children up to be faithful Christians. Uh, once again, thank you for all that you do to help your family grow closer to God. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you today thanking you for your love and your care for us. We pray that you'll continue to watch over us and protect our congregation. We pray that we'll be able to resume a normal life as soon as possible and assemble together for worship once again. Father, there are several of our number who are suffering with various health conditions, and we pray for their healing. There are those who have recently had surgeries and procedures, and we pray for their continued recovery. Father, there are others who have lost loved ones this past week, and we pray for their comfort and their peace uh, during this very difficult time. Father, there are some who are, are waiting for test results, and we know that that can be a very anxious time, and we pray for their peace of mind, and we pray that the test results will be good. Father, help us to reach out to all of these and help in any way that we can. We pray for your guidance, and we pray that you work in each of these situations to bring about the best possible outcomes. Father, today we especially thank you for our mothers. We thank you for their love for us, and we thank you for the positive influence that Christian mothers can have on their families. We thank you for the blessings that they bring into our lives. And Father, we pray that you'll bless them and that you'll give them patience and courage and strength to face the challenges that can sometimes come uh, while raising children. And Father, help us to always appreciate them and show our love for them. Father, we pray that as we continue through this unusual time that you will help us to look to you for our strength and our comfort Help us to realize that you are in control and that we should always put our trust and faith in you uh, no matter what comes our way. Father, we pray that you watch over us and always keep us in your care. Father, we want to thank you for your son Jesus. We want to thank you for his love and we thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for all the blessings we receive through him and it is in his name that we offer this prayer. Amen. I do want to remind you uh, that if you haven't filled out the survey that the elders sent out on Wednesday by email, um, that you do so uh, just as soon as possible. Uh, this information uh, will help give us a sense of how the congregation feels as we uh, begin to formulate plans to start a phased approach to meeting again as a congregation. Um, you know, we're hoping to be able to meet just as soon as possible. As we do begin meeting again, uh, it will be imperative that each person follows any guidelines that may be set forth, uh, such as wearing masks, not shaking hands, not hugging, or whatever the guidelines may be. While you may be comfortable with being close to others, others may not be as comfortable with that as you are. Um, we will need to make sure that we are respectful of each other during this time. Following the guidelines will help make this transition go smoothly and it will allow us to begin worshiping uh, together 
again and enjoying each other's company once again. The purpose of the guidelines will be to keep everyone safe and healthy. We anticipate being able to uh, begin sharing these plans with you in the next couple of weeks or, weeks or so uh, as they're developed. With that said, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Be safe, and we hope to see you soon.